Well, good morning. That's good news, isn't it? God's presence is with us. That's what I want to talk to you about this morning, just a really simple idea, God's presence and the difference that makes in our life. And I'll be using an example, uh, the example of Joseph and Mary in the very first Christmas and how uh, they had to endure uh, literally a, a living hell, but because God was with them, they were able to do that. It's a story of an unexpected pregnancy and uh, all the things that come with pregnancy. And uh, our family, uh, or my wife is pregnant again, not our family, but uh, we have another baby coming. And uh, so what happens when this kind of stuff comes around, you quickly get reminded how much help men need in addressing pregnant women or new mothers. Because uh, guys, many of you know, at least of other guys who have said some innocent but terrible things to pregnant ladies. So I'm here to help you today. And uh, so I went on uh, in enemy ground, you know, Women love these things called blogs, and uh, they get on there and they write off-color jokes about us men, about how clueless we are, and um, <clears throat> and then they put our pictures and say this is this is an example of of that what I told you. But I found something helpful. It's a top ten list of what not to say to pregnant women or new mothers, and I'm going to share eight of them because two of them were inappropriate. Like I told you, they're off-color. So I'm going to share a few of them, guys, because I'm here to help you. All right. <clears throat> I've already got all these masters, of course, so I'm just here to share them with you. Number one, never say to a pregnant woman or a new mother that you look so big or even you look so small. And they describe it as being a teenager. And when you're a teenager, you never, ever want to stand out. And so a mother doesn't want to hear you look so big like you have some big freaky baby inside. Or you look so small because you have some sick peanut baby inside. You never, ever want to say anything like that. Resist the urge, guys, punch yourself and walk away when you feel like saying that. And you don't even have to say it with your mouth. If your eyes get big when you see a woman that's nine months pregnant, she'll know what you're thinking. So watch your facial expressions as well. Number two, never ever ask a pregnant woman, have you had that baby yet? Now, this is sad that we've actually had, I know of three men at Cornerstone that have done this before. And uh, they, they paid a price, I'll tell you that. They're dead men. Okay, number three, never say to a woman, and actually this comes from, a woman actually said this to another mother, uh, so I like that it's not just the guys that screw up, but a woman actually said this. She went up to another mom and said, you look so tired, you must be having a girl because she's stealing your beauty. Okay, never ever say that, women, all right? Okay. A bunch of dumb people in the world, right? Jeez. Number four, I can't read. Uh, number five, oh, I don't even understand this. When people go up to pregnant people and say, sleep now because you're not going to be able to in nine months. As if we can bank up sleep and go to it when we're tired, when we have baby screaming. Doesn't happen. Number six, never ever tell a new mother or a pregnant lady that you hate a certain name. As if they're going to change the name of their child because you dislike a certain name because some girl in middle school dumped you. Never, ever say you hate a certain name. Number seven, never say to a new mother holding her baby girl or baby boy, were you hoping for a boy or girl instead? And definitely never say that when the kids are old enough to understand what you're saying. That should go without saying, but it doesn't. We're men. Okay, number eight, never ask a pregnant woman, was this an accident? Never, ever ask that. You might get your lights punched out. Number nine, I'll have to skip. And number 10, never, ever say, should you be eating that to a new mother or pregnant lady? <laughs> ever. We're in training, guys, right? And I'm here to help you. All right, so Mary and Joseph, they would have appreciated my joke, uh, that list today. Uh, they had to endure all of this, bonehead people, but they also had to endure a living hell when they brought their first child, Jesus, into the world. And I want to share that story with you today because it helps us understand how to connect to the meaning and message of Christmas. You know, there was a prophet in Israel 700 years before the birth of Jesus. His name was Isaiah. And he had the job of being a prophet, which meant he went and spoke on behalf of God to the people to warn them, uh, to give them instructions about what to do. And, and he's in Jerusalem during a bad time, and he's warning Israel. And, and his, his prophecy is, is not really good news, but um, sporadic in there, or pieces of it, were hopeful uh, prophecies about what would happen in the future. And they're about Jesus. And this is what Isaiah 
says in chapter 7, it's a prophecy about the Christmas story. It says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So Isaiah here, and the angels would later do it, and Mary and Joseph with their life, they would announce the message of Christmas, and that is that God's presence, which has always been uh, on earth, but his presence is now becoming more accessible and intimate to every, pe- every person through this baby that would be born that would have the name Jesus. Emmanuel comes from the Hebrew word, which means God is with us. A God who wants to intricately weave his life into ours. When Isaiah said this, he was making a philosophical statement. A lot of times people wonder in philosophy discussions, if there is a God, is he a transcendent God way out there, uh, disconnected from us? Or uh, if he is a, uh, there is a God, is he in creation? Is he in the world? Well, we find the answer here. That the transcendent God of heaven that created everything isn't in creation, but he entered creation as a person. It's a theological statement. What is God like? All you have to do is look to Jesus to answer the question, what is God like? But it's also a hugely personal and practical statement. God is with us. God was with Mary and Joseph, and he's with us. The message of Christmas is that God is with us and has been, and we connect to his presence by treasuring his very words and pondering them in our heart. I'm going to end with this. And we also uh, connect to God's presence by inviting his spirit, his very presence into our life to bring about new life and to bring power. Isaiah chapter 9, 6 and 7, he goes on to describe what it would be like when Emmanuel would be with us. That's what he says. For to us a child is born and a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, which doesn't mean therapist, which is a, a, good, a good role. But what they're referring to here is that this baby would be wonderful in his insight and wisdom for living. He would be full of insight and living for people. He would also be called Mighty God. A name used, uh, reserved for the God that created. The God that is, has been around for, from the very beginning. But also the name given to the God that judges. And in our culture... One of the things we dislike the most about God or have the hardest time is that he judges. But when something like what happened on Friday happens, deep down we're glad there's a judge. We're glad that someday someone who can end it all will end all that pain. And so this baby would also be that mighty God. This baby would also be everlasting father. What an intimate picture of the creator God, the judge, that he's a father who nurtures us, who we can know and who knows us. Beautiful picture. And lastly, we see in Isaiah 9 that he would be called the prince of peace. The source of inner rest for every person who draws from him. The source of inner rest. This baby's very nature would be fully God and fully man, and he would be the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and Prince of Peace. That's an amazing story, full of meaning. But it's possible that this becomes empty and mundane to us when we hear it every year. It's easy for us to not connect our story with this story, and when we look at our lives, our lives are, full of, uh, are, are, are not full of wisdom, and there's so little power, and there's so little strength, and so little love and affirmation, and so little peace. Our stories are very disconnected. Our reality is defined by what happens around us. And what we need to do at a time like this during Advent is we need to take the story that took place 2,000 years ago and pull it into our story so that when we think about our lives, we think of our lives in light of this story, that God is with us. And when God is with us, we have the wisdom, the strength, the love, and the peace that we need to live our lives. Now, I want to give you an example of this that comes... Uh, that comes from Joseph and Mary. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 1. It'll also be up on the screen if you'd like to read it there. Starting in verse 18. Matthew gives an account of the Christmas story. He includes people like the kings and uh, King Herod, uh, and the three wise men and King Herod. Luke has an account of it. He includes the shepherds and the census. So all these different parts, they kind of make up the Christmas story together. Let's read Matthew 1.18. So now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. 
When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with a child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. And an incredible story. An incredible example of faith, incredible example of, with Joseph and Mary of people who let God's presence make a difference. And I want to talk about both of them because they're both amazing. They both had unique challenges, but they shared some together, and they're amazing. Let's start with Mary. We're told in verse 18 that Mary would be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. And an angel actually came to her and said, Mary, you're going to have a baby. And, uh, and she said, well, how could this be? I'm a virgin. And he said, the Holy Spirit is going to come and it's going to empty your, enter your empty womb and bring about life. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He enters empty space, dead space, and brings out life. And so the Holy Spirit says, I'm going to come and enter your womb and you're going to have this baby. Now, this is an incredible interruption to Mary. This is one of the most exciting times in her life and she has a lot of things going on. Number one is planning a wedding. And planning a wedding that would take place for several days, she's getting married to Joseph, a man that she probably knew her whole life in this village, a man that for the last few years has been pursuing her and has uh, been pursuing her family so that they would give her hand to him in marriage. At this time, we see that they've already made a commitment to one another because we're told that they're betrothed to one another. And to be betrothed is more than our modern day engagement. It's legal. It's legal. And it takes a divorce to break it. And so they've already committed themselves in every way, yet they're not married because they have not uh, consummated the marriage. And so that she's in this special time, this exciting time in her life, and she gets this interruption. Now, Mary's amazing. She just said, how can this be? Uh, you know, I'm, I've, I'm a virgin. But I'm sure she had a lot of questions in her head, but they don't start coming out like, why me? Why now? Why not? After I get married, can you help me understand more? Am I going to be able to do it? But in Luke, we see her response, and it's amazing. She says, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. So how could a young girl, probably teenager, how could she respond with such faith and obedience? Well, the answer is that God is with Mary. And when God is with you, you have the wisdom that you need to be guided in life. You have his strength to sustain you. You have his love to affirm you. And you have his peace to calm the storms. How could she do it? Well, God is with her. And she's a remarkable person. She's presented in the scriptures as one of the most godly people that has ever lived outside of Jesus, perhaps. And our friends the Catholics, I think, make too big of a deal out of Mary giving her divine qualities. I think she's in heaven right now worshiping Jesus because she's not divine. But as Protestants, we make too little of her. She's amazing. She's an amazing example of beauty and faith and what it means to be a woman. She's a great example for young women to follow. She's exemplary in every way. She's lived a life of chastity. She's hardworking. She's full of humility. And she would be faithful to her family and to God the rest of her life, enduring great suffering along the way. She's an awesome example of how to be a woman. This week I heard someone say that, you know, difference between Mary and a lot of people today is Mary didn't use her youth and her singleness as an example to live wild and to make choices that really hurt her. She didn't use that as an example. She had been preparing herself for her life. Young people today often think that as soon as God shows us what we're going to do with our life, that's when we'll start to grow up and get our things together. But it doesn't work that way. You prepare for the future by honoring God right now with what you have. We don't know what's in front of us. And Mary didn't, but she had been honoring God. She's lived as a godly little girl, 
She'd be a godly young wife and young woman. She'd be a godly mother, godly older woman, and she'd even have to endure the worst thing a parent could ever have to face, and that is the death and murder of their child. She's been there. Mary's amazing. And Mary is obeying. And she's going to face a great challenge. She's one of many women who would have to explain an unexpected pregnancy to other people. And so she'd have to carry the worry that would come with that. What, would my fam- what will my family think now that they know I'm pregnant? Will they believe me? What about my friends? What about the rest of this village? What about my reputation? And most of all, what about Joseph? What if Joseph doesn't believe me? What if Joseph thinks that this is another man's baby? What if he doesn't believe me and he divorces me? She probably began to go down the logical road of, I might have to raise this baby without him. I might be a single mother. I might never get married. That's what Mary is facing. Yet she said, I'm the Lord's servant. Later, she'd be asked to take a very difficult journey. She has to travel to Bethlehem from the north part of Israel to the central part. She's going to be on a donkey on a dusty, uh, dusty country road. Um, and she's laboring. She's nine months pregnant. Can you imagine women being nine months pregnant riding on a donkey on a dusty country road? And then to find out that the only relief that you can find and your husband can find for you when the baby is coming, when, when uh, labor is happening, is this old, dirty barn, this home for animals. And then you get into the barn and you look and there are no doctors. The only person there is your future husband. How traumatizing for Joseph. I mean for Mary. (laughs) Guys, if you don't have kids yet, you'll never be ready for it. But it's awesome. But it's traumatizing for both of them. How could she do all this? How could she endure her son's death? How could she deal with this reputation? By the way, you know about the reputation thing? Later on in John, we're told that Jesus is mocked by others saying, you don't even know who your father is. People believe Jesus was a bastard child. And him and his mother had this reputation. She had to face all that. How could she do this? Well, God is with Mary. And when God is with a person, you have the wisdom, the strength, the love, and the peace that you need to keep going. And if things weren't bad enough, there's this evil king in Israel right now that really is just working for the Romans. His name is King Herod. And King Herod uh, reads the scriptures, and he knows that something special just happened. The king of the Jews, the Messiah, the anointed one, this promised one, has been born. And Herod is threatened. So you know what he does? He does the unthinkable. He orders the murder of every child in this area, every boy under the age of two. He doesn't just order it, but it happens. It's terrible. And Mary and Joseph are given a gift. They're told to flee. And so as Mary and Joseph flee to Egypt, I bet they told as many people as possible something terrible is about to happen. But can you imagine that road to Egypt hurting for the parents who were about to lose their son. The guilt they might have had that they got out and others didn't, yet the relief. This is the environment in which Jesus was born. They run away to a faraway place. Jesus becomes a refugee. Mary and Joseph become a refugee. They go to Egypt where they have to build a life together for a few years. They know no one most likely. They have nothing and they have to figure it out. They're all by themselves in a new place. Have you ever been there? Leaving your friends, your church. They've been there. Well, how could they do this? How could she do this? Well, God is with Mary. And when God is with you, you have the wisdom, the strength, the love, and peace you need to keep going. Now there's Joseph. And Joseph, too, is an incredible example of faith. And we see this despite not having a lot of detail about his life, but we're told enough about Joseph. We're told that Joseph, in verse 19, that Joseph is a just man, which means that Joseph is a good man. And to be a good man, you get all these benefits that others get to experience. And so to be a good man, you find men that are humble, yet they're strong. They can make decisions. They protect people, yet they're gentle. 
He's kind and he's faithful. He's responsible and hardworking. He provides for his family. His character has distinguished him apart from other men, at least to Mary and her family, that this is an appropriate man for Mary to marry. And so uh, he's distinguished himself to her family. They say, you're a safe person for our daughter. And we give her hand to you in marriage. And the only way Joseph could do this is through his character. He too is young. He's a young man. But he has this amazing character. He's not waiting, as many males do, to start acting like a man. Marriage is for men because it's hard. Because it requires that you lose your life, that you sacrifice for your wife and your family. Marriage is for men. Unfortunately, lots of males get married and don't do their job. Well, Joseph is young, and he's prepared for his job, and he's ready to be married. Joseph has the qualities that all of us dads want for our sons. He has the qualities that every parent of a daughter wants for their daughter someday, and a husband. So how did he do this? How did he grow up so quick? Well, God is with Joseph. And when God is with you, you have the wisdom, strength, love, peace that you need to grow up. So that you can love people and make commitments and promises and keep them. Now this too is an exciting time for Joseph. He's been working hard, distinguishing himself, saving money, to be ready to be married. Yet he gets some bad news. It's the worst news that he could have ever heard and that is that Mary is pregnant. And he knows what that means because Joseph has done everything right. And he's saving sex for marriage at this time. And he says, I haven't touched Mary. So that means that this is the baby of another man. And Joseph immediately has to deal with the betrayal of the person that he loves the most. And it's devastating. Unfortunately, as pastors, we have to hear about infidelity too often. But what we hear from people that are uh, going through it is that it's worse than death. Maybe the worst thing that he could have experienced. But Joseph is a just man. We're told that he's unwilling to put her to shame. He puts himself to shame because he has to go to this public place to get a public divorce because this is a legally binding relationship, their betrothal. Now, Joseph could have gone for revenge. Jewish law allowed maybe for uh, Mary to be put to death. An unfaithful spouse at times was put to death. It didn't happen often, but it could. But Joseph doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want to shame her. He doesn't want to hate her. He doesn't want to get even. But he knows he can't be with her. In fact, he probably still loves her, but he knows he can't be with her. And so he's going to let her go. And Joseph, this strong man, probably cries himself to sleep night after night. But in the midst of his despair, Joseph, too, gets a message from God. He gets the word of the Lord on which that he can treasure and ponder in his own heart. And that is this, in this dream, he's told that this is all true. The miracle is true. You're to believe it. And not only are you to believe it, Joseph, but you should obey God's command. And so he takes Mary as his wife and Jesus as his son. And he takes him off to Egypt and he keeps him safe. And he gives Jesus the name Jesus that he heard in the dream. See, Joseph doesn't just believe, but he obeys. That's one of the signs of a man. Not to someone that believes God, but obeys God. About all the rest we know of Joseph is that he would spend his life as a carpenter. Most likely, he would take Jesus and his other kids, his other sons with him, off to his shop to build things. And I think this is really neat about Joseph. You know, in answering the question, where did Jesus learn to be a man? Where did Jesus learn to be a man? He learned it from his father. At home, watching his dad love his mom. At home watching his dad love his siblings. At home with his dad loving him. At work where his dad would take him learning his trades. He would learn how to be a man from this humble, ordinary, self-effacing, his self-effacing father. Jesus learned to be a man from his hardworking, strong, and faithful dad. Joseph is a man who accepts responsibility for things that he did not create. What else good men do? And he will love this woman and this son the rest of his life. And these are people with a reputation, as I said earlier. People probably came up to Joseph and said, are you sure you want to do this? You're crazy. And Mary is lying to you. There's another man, and she's lying to you. This is not from God, and you're a joke. You're being played. And Joseph had to face that. Probably year after year. And he would answer, yes, I am. The Lord has spoken. I believe believe him, and I'm going to obey. 
How could Joseph do this? Well, he's allowed God to transform his ego and his ambitions. Something that every one of us men must do to be the men God has called us to be. God does not remove our ego and ambitions, but he transforms them. And Joseph has been undone. And so how could Joseph be such a man? Well, God is with Joseph. And when God is with you, you have the wisdom, the strength, the love, and the peace you need to be the man or the woman God has called you to be. And just like us guys, Joseph has some common problems. He's going to worry about providing for his family. He's going to feel bad that Mary's going to give birth in a barn. He's going to be apologizing to her over and over again. He's going to have all of those feelings. But he follows God. And how does he do it? How does he deal with all this? God is with him. So as I begin to close, I just want to make this personal for each one of us and uh, connect you to the story by asking, how do you deal with something like an unexpected pregnancy? Or how do you deal with infertility? There's many women in here that would love nothing more than to be pregnant, and they can't be. How do you deal with relational turmoil? Or the loss of your reputation? How do you deal with the judgment and the shame of others? How do you deal with being separated from your family, either because of a move or because of death? How do you deal with the loneliness of a new place? The anxiety over your family and its safety. How do you deal with providing for your family and worrying about a job and a home? How do you deal with betrayal and murder and death? How do we keep from being ruled by these dark things that are happening around us? How do we keep from being weighed down and just saying, my life is only defined by those things? How? The same way they did. By remembering that God was with them, but that God is still with us. And that's great news. And when God is with us, we have the wisdom, the strength, the love and peace we need to keep going and to follow him. The message of Christmas is that God is still around and he's still helping people. But he doesn't want to remain at the periphery of our Christmas or our lives how could the God of heaven, who's uh, now a, a, a man who is a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace, how could he be at the periphery of someone's life? He needs to be at the center. That's his place. He's the savior. Now, God is available to everyone, but of course, we all don't access him the way that we should. Many people just see Jesus as a teacher and just rely on his ideas, but they don't really see a life with him. They don't interact with him. Here's how C.S. Lewis describes this. And this is in Mere Christianity. He said, put right out of your head the idea that all these ideas about Jesus are fancy ways of saying Christians are to read what Jesus said and try to carry it out, just as a man may read Plato or Marx, what the things that they said, and try to carry it out. They mean something much more than that. They mean that a real person, Jesus the Messiah, here and now, in that very room where they are praying and saying their prayers, is doing things to them and doing things to you. It is not a question of a good man who died 2,000 years ago. It is a question of a living man, as much a man as you and me, and still as much God as he was when he created the world, really coming and interfacing with every one of us. God's presence makes a big difference. Here are two ways, as I close and the worship team comes out, that I want to give you of the ways that we access God's presence, the way that we make sure that our story is connecting to his story and this part of his story. Two ways. Number one, just as, as Joseph and Mary did, we are to treasure God's word in our heart and ponder it. In Luke chapter 2, 19, that's where I get this phrase. We're told of Mary that she was told all these wonderful things about Jesus. The wise men said things. The shepherds, the angels, the, God himself had said all these things. She probably even remembered the words of Isaiah. And it said that of all these things spoken of Jesus, the truth of God, the word of God, that she held them close to her heart. She treasured them. She made them her own. She received them. But then she pondered them. She thought of them. We see the same with Joseph. Not only did he get God's word and treasure it, it gave him life. But what did he do? He obeyed God's word, as did Mary. 
The Lord has a message for every one of us. Sometimes there's some unique messages that God gives us, and we're to treasure them and obey, and they're for us. The Lord's given us some messages that we all get to share together. He's given us his scripture, the Bible, that's full of promises and and, 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 uh, wonderful things to say about how we should live our lives. God's wisdom, his peace, his strength, his love, it's in here. And so what we do is we take God's word and we pray it and we meditate on it and we think it and we read it. And what do we do? We treasure it. And we ponder it in our heart and then we obey it. And there might be some people in the room that you've never ever heard anything from God But I want to tell you that there's one clear message that he gives through the whole Bible and through all of history, and it's for every one of us. And that is that Jesus made a choice. And his choice was that he did not want to live life separate from you or from me. And so he came to this earth and he died our death. And not only died our death, but he rose to life saying, I'm going to give you the life that you're so badly trying to get on your own. And I'm going to give it to you, and it's absolutely free. Come and follow me. That's the message. That's God's word that we treasure and ponder every day and especially this time of year. Why? Because God's presence is still with us. God is with us. So we take his word, we ponder it and obey it. And number two, we invite God's presence into our life. The Holy Spirit is God's presence. In John chapter 14, we're given many passages about the Spirit. Jesus says, I'm going to go away. The Spirit's going to come. And, and the Spirit is unique because it can be everywhere at once and with everyone at once. But it's my very Spirit. And this is the Spirit that will give you wisdom and strength, love and peace, all those things that you so badly need to live your life. And it's Jesus' way of saying, I'm still with you until I come back. I'm still with you. It's beautiful. And I'm coming back in a much better way. But while, that, while you wait for that, you're to access my presence by inviting the Spirit in. And when a person invites the Holy Spirit into their life, you, we connect to his power. The same power that performed miracles, the same power that brought Jesus back from the dead, the same power that reached inside Mary's womb and brought about life. The Holy Spirit allows us to connect to something powerful. And when you feel weak, this is a wonderful message. Weak and helpless that there is power and God has it for you. The Holy Spirit does another thing through this power is it brings life in dead places or empty places. There's a lot of dead parts of our heart. There's a lot of empty places in our hearts and minds. And the Holy Spirit is what enters that place to bring about life and renewal. And so you fill in the blank. What is that for you? What needs to be touched? Maybe you're just ready to grow up. Maybe you're ready to take responsibility. Maybe you're ready to love someone that's difficult. Maybe you're ready to keep trusting God when times are tough. Maybe you're ready to be obedient with every area of your life. Well, the Holy Spirit needs to come and give you the power, but it needs to come in that dead place and bring about all this new life. C.S. Lewis said in his book, Narnia, when God's presence comes, it's like the spring that comes to an endless winter. It's what the Spirit does. It brings life. To fill that void. The message of Christmas is that God is still with us. And that's my message for you. It's really, really good news. So we treasure his word. We obey it. And we invite the Spirit to come in. And as we do that, God gives us what we need. And so when you begin to ask, how am I going to deal with this? How am I going to deal with that? How am I going to face certain things? Well, the answer is simple. God is with us. And he will be. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this simple message. It's really elementary that your presence makes a difference. But Lord, we understand ourselves and we look into our hearts and we know that we often live so disconnected from your presence. Many days go by without connecting with you. We make decisions. We deal with problems without you. Lord, help us to turn away from that and return to you. Lord, we understand that your presence is a great resource to us, and you are the greatest treasure. You're the greatest gift that we could receive at this season. So, Father, we ask for help in connecting to you. Thank you that your presence is always there, that your spirit is always ready to enter those empty places. Lord, give us an attention and a heart that's turned towards you. Father, I pray that we would take your word this Christmas, 
your promises, your gospel, the very things that you've said to us, and we would treasure them in our heart. They'd be wonderful things, special treasures that we would ponder and love. And then, Lord, I also pray that we would experience your Holy Spirit as we say, come and fill my life. Fill the dark places, the dead places, the empty places. Bring about power, bring about life, and help me be the person that you've called me to be. Lord, thank you that you are still with us. We love you and pray this in Jesus' name.